the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Friends, on this beautiful day, this beautiful morning, we celebrate the feast of the Most Holy Trinity, the God who is love. So gathered in Christ's presence, as we always do, we gather mindful of the wounds that we bear, certainly mindful of our own sin, but in this moment of the Mass, ever mindful of the mercy, the love, and the gift of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, at the closeness of our God. So friends, with confidence we pray, I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask the Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and to you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me. And may Almighty God have mercy on us, may he forgive us our sin and bring us to everlasting life. Confessing the true faith, we may acknowledge the Trinity of eternal glory and adore your unity, powerful in majesty. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever.
A reading from the book of Proverbs. The wisdom of God cries aloud. The Lord created me when his purpose first unfolded before the oldest of his works. From everlasting I was firmly set, from the beginning, before earth came into being. The deep was not when I was born, there were no springs to gush with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I came to birth. Before he made the earth, the countryside, or the first grains of the world's dust. When he fixed the heavens firm, I was there. When he drew a ring on the surface of the deep, when he thickened the clouds above, when he fixed fast the springs of the deep, when he assigned the sea its boundaries and the waters shall not invade the shore, when he laid down the foundations of the earth, I was by his side. A master craftsman, delighting him day after day, ever at play in his presence, at play everywhere in his world, delighting to be with the sons of men. The word of the Lord. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, by faith we are judged righteous and at peace with God, since it is by faith and through Jesus 
that we have entered this state of grace in which we can boast about looking forward to God's glory. But that is not all we can boast about. We can boast about our sufferings. These sufferings bring patience, as we know. And patience brings perseverance. And perseverance brings hope. And this hope is not deceptive because the love of God has been poured into our, into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which has been given us. The word of the Lord. Gospel according to John. Jesus said to his disciples, I still have many things to say to you but they would be too much for you now. But when the spirit of truth comes, he will lead you to the complete truth, since he will not be speaking as from himself, but he will say only what he has learned, and he will tell you of the things to come. He will glorify me, since all he tells you will be taken from what is mine. Everything the Father has is mine, that is why I said all he tells you will be taken from what is mine. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise well, friends, it's interesting to contemplate the fact that these, at least it is for me, an extraordinary chunk, chunk of Jesus' life uh, is hidden from our eyes, from human eyes, even human history, that we know we have the hidden years of Christ, but they're actually quite significant. There's a huge chunk there. At best, we probably have, what, three to four years knowing Jesus' words and Jesus' ministry, but by and large, Jesus' life largely remains hidden, his earthly life. And then that meant that even after his resurrection, people asked the question, well, where is he? After Jesus rose from the dead, the four, rather the 40 days between when he rose and then his ascension, he appears 10, 12 times, depends how you count them. But he only ever appears to those who knew him, which is extraordinary. Tradition tells us, get this, the first person he appeared to was his mother. <laughs> All right, he appears to only those who knew him. He doesn't appear to Herod. He doesn't appear to Pontius Pilate. It's extraordinary, right? He doesn't appear to the soldiers. He doesn't appear to any of them. The ones that he appears to are his disciples. Mary of Magdala, his mother, <laughs> right? I probably would have done it a little bit differently, but I'm not Jesus, hey? so... <laughs> But wouldn't this have been the perfect opportunity for him to prove that they were wrong and he was right? And yet he doesn't do that. 
Rather, the risen Lord only appears, extraordinary even now saying it, he only appears to those who sought him. We could say those who had eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to love. Only those who knew him, only those who loved him. And what it meant is that there were a whole plethora of people who had met Jesus in his earthly life and said, well, where is he now? Where is God? This man who claimed to be God, we know it was God, where is he? Where is God? Where is Jesus? He now seems so hidden. But rather we know better that it's not a God who hides from us, but rather ourselves who hide from God. But the question is still the same question on so many lips today. Well, if Jesus is God, well, where is he? Where is he gone? When will he show himself again? Is he no more to be touched, no more to be seen, no more to be heard, and no more, and here's the word, to be experienced? But now, now does he just remain this sort of divine, mystical illusion of the past? Where is God? When will he reveal himself? But the truth is, we know that God has revealed himself. And he continues to reveal himself now in the most extraordinary, I think the right word is mind-blowing ways, a new marvellous way. We see that God reveals himself, of course, in his son, in the incarnation, that God now takes human flesh. There is now flesh in the Trinity, dwelling with God. Uh, Before the incarnation, God did not have human flesh. Now God has human flesh. And then we see, too, only a few weeks ago, the breath of God, the Holy Spirit, the wisdom of God is breathed into creation, breathed into you and I, the crown and the jewel of creation, the human being. Our God continually reveals himself, but now we arrive today at the culmination of all these feasts that we've celebrated, of the incarnation of Christmas, of the resurrection of Easter, uh, of the ascension into heaven. We now arrive at the culmination, the pinnacle of everything we know and everything we love. And that is the feast of the most holy trinity. One God, three divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The image of God who is perfect love. They, they often joke that, uh, that Trinity Sunday, at least for priests, that Trinity Sunday is the hardest, it's the preacher's nightmare. But I can't help but think it's the preacher's dream. Because the Trinity is the reality or the truth that is at the heart of everything that possesses the human person. Everything that possesses us from day to day. A God who now makes himself known, in fact so known in human experience, that he dwells in plain sight. The doctrine of the Trinity is the most uh, extraordinary doctrine, but yet at the same time I can confidently say it is the most ordinary of doctrines. It is the most, believe me, it's the most commonplace of doctrines of beliefs. It is the most familiar doctrine of belief that we profess. And why do I say that? Because in the first letter of John, we've all heard it quoted, the first letter of John we hear, God is love. Now again, it's not just something for a nice hallmark card. God is love, isn't that sweet? No, God isn't just, uh, God isn't someone who loves. God isn't, uh, has the attribute of love. God is love. And when we recognise that, we begin to realise that we have a God who is closer to us than we could ever dare to imagine. This is a mystery, the Trinity, of course, but not in the sense that it can't, be, it can't be understood. It can be to an extent, but it's a mystery that it continues to draw us deeper and deeper and deeper into love. The mystery of the Trinity, and here it is, is not something just to be studied. It's fascinating to study, right? So we have theology, it's wonderful. But it's an experience to be lived. It's a truth to be lived. The God who is love, the God who is not distant. This divine reality actually consumes everything that we know and everything that we love. We really think about it. What is that feeling that a mother has? I've said it before, but what is the feeling that a mother has gazing into the eyes of a baby? What is the feeling of distress a mother or a father have when when their child is suffering? What is the feeling that a husband and wife have? Well, the husband, I've celebrated plenty of weddings. When he turns around, he sees the woman he's about to marry. doesn't matter how tough he is, a tear always. What is that? What is the feeling that a daughter has as her father is dying on his deathbed and then he's gone, then he's dead? What is that? 
What is the feeling, probably risky here, but what is the feeling of the care we have when we see children in Ukraine suffering and dying? If it's just survival of the fittest, then who cares? We're safe. But it's not. There's a part of us that is drawn. There's a part of us that is broken. There's a part of us that is invested. Now, by and large, we would say, oh, they're experiences of love. But what they are more truly, friends, is that which is embedded deep within our human nature, evidence of something which is far more eternal, that goes down to the very depths and the molten core of everything we experience. And that is the experience of the God who is love, the God who mesmerizes us and draws us deeper and deeper. I always say it takes a lifetime to fall in love, and indeed it does. But this is precisely what the God of love does and who the God of love is. I remember uh, in West Wyalong, uh, the, the primary school, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but I am. The primary school students walked in their classroom one day and they're drawing pictures of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I remember leaning over a little girl and saying, oh, that's, that's fascinating, it's beautiful. So we don't really know what God looks like, uh, do we? She just turns to me and says, give me a minute and I'll show you. <laughs> but see, this is the great mystery that we learn, we're falling in love each and every day, but it is love that is at the pinnacle. It is love that is at the heart. That God is not distant, that God is not hidden, the great question after Jesus' resurrection, well, where is he? But God is more intimately close to us than we could ever dare to imagine. Mark Twain in in 1897 coined one of the phrases uh, that has become most famous in English literature in his, his book Following the Equator, truth is stranger than fiction. And many people quote it, truth is stranger than fiction, period. But it continues, truth is stranger than fiction because fiction needs to abide by what the human mind thinks possible. Truth does not. And I can't help but think, is that not the truth when it comes to the Trinity, to the God who is not distant, but the God who is the very substance of the relationships that we cherish and experience? Whenever we love in a way that is insatiable, Good on you, but it's not you. It's not you. It's something deeply embedded within your nature that the God who breathes has breathed this truth into you. It's not survival of the fittest. There's something mesmerizing about the human person. We're drawn into love. We're drawn to protect. We're drawn to change. We're drawn to transform. And that is God's mark upon us. Indeed, the mark of the Trinity The truth is so much stranger than any fiction you and I could ever come up with ourselves. And if you don't believe me, well, then think about the ideas of gods that we've come up with in the past. Ancient Greek gods, the uh, the Roman gods. What are they? The best thing that you and I can come up with is a God who is vengeful, a God who, when he comes close, we get out of the way because he's, you know, fire and brimstone, he'll destroy us. Uh, a, A God who is competing with you and I, so we've got to have to be careful. A God that we need to continually offer sacrifice to so he doesn't get too angry. But see, that's not our fault. That's the best image that we can, you and I can come up with, the human person can come up with. But God reveals himself as love, something that we could never know had he not deigned to reveal it to us. That is the truth. And yet in his great love, what does he do? He does reveal it to us. And he reveals it gradually. Why? Because it takes a lifetime to fall in love. We hear in the reading today... The Lord says, I have so much more to say to you. All has not been said, all has been said in my son, but now you need to learn what that love means. To fall in love with my son, to fall in love with me through the gift and the grace of the Holy Spirit. Friends, that's the gift of life. We have a God who is not hidden. We can't ask the question, well, where is God? Because in fact, he's close to us than we could ever imagine. God is the very fabric of of the relationships that we cherish. God is love. I find it extraordinary. So many people profess, no one really believes this, but they're, they're, oh, they don't believe in God. And you see how they adore and love their children. They love their, their family. They love their friends. It's kind of ironic because that is love. That is God. You're living in the presence of the God who is not distant, but gives you life itself, gives you love itself. Friends, we don't need to look far to experience and know the Trinity the God who is love and perfect love. As I said before, at the molten core of everything we long for, of everything we desire, of everything that consoles. What is that feeling that a mother has gazing into the eyes of her child? Perhaps the most perfect of all love that we could see in this life. 
What is that feeling? It's not just an emo- emotion that's passing. It's not coming from us. It's proof and evidence of the God who dwells close, the God who is love. And friends, that is truly a truth that is so much stranger than any fiction that you or I could ever come up with. So as we celebrate this gift today, let us know that we have a God who gives us very life. He's closer to us than, it's kind of scary. He's seen absolutely everything. Every emotion that draws us to another, God is present. Every gaze of love that we share, God is present. Every moment that we grieve, here's another one, we grieve for those who have died. Why do we do that? That is, again, evidence of a God who is close. The death raises so many questions for you and I, but I can't help but think that it actually raises or gives us finally an answer. And that is that our love is actually worth something. Our relationships are actually worth something. And what they are are evidence of a God who doesn't stay distant, but a God who is close. And friends, I'll finish by saying when we begin to understand the Trinity like this, we begin to see that God isn't that foreign at all. In fact, he's the very substance of everything we are. So let us celebrate that today. Let us worship the God of truth, the God of love, the God of hope. Again, in the the first reading, we heard that it leads, well, the second reading, rather, it leads to perseverance, leads to patience, leads to perseverance, leads to hope. Hope in what? This isn't, this life is not uh, the life we're called to. We're called to the eternal life to live in the Trinity. So friends, lest I speak all day, let us always worship in truth the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And let us each and every day, when we rise, When we go to sleep at night, let us pray, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Friends, confident and bound up in the God who is love, let us now stand and with confidence profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Friends, in baptism, we become members of Christ's body and are drawn into the divine life. So let us now pray to our Father in the name of his Son, through the power of the Holy Spirit. For the leaders of your church, particularly Pope Francis and Archbishop Christopher, may they, guided by the Spirit, share the marvels and mysteries of God throughout the world. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. For the baptized, may we, united in our shared identity as the body of Christ, 
bring his peace and hope to all. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. For the Queen, may she, on her official birthday and platinum jubilee, continue to know the steadfast love of God and serve her people faithfully. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. In this National Refugee Week, for all forced to flee their homes and communities, may they be welcomed and supported to rebuild their lives in new lands. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. For all receiving the sacrament of confirmation in this season, may they, sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit, be conformed to Christ and filled with faith and joy. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who have died, particularly those killed on Pentecost at the St. Francis Saviour Church in Nigeria, may they rejoice in the company of the Trinity in a heavenly home. Lord, hear us. Lord. Hear these prayers, Heavenly Father, and strengthen us to discern the counsel of the Holy Spirit so that we may grow in holiness and draw closer to you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Amen. 
Sanctified by the invocation of your name, we pray, O Lord our God, this oblation of our service, and by it make us an eternal offering to you, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Confessing of the true and eternal Godhead, you might be adored in what is proper to each person, their unity in substance and their equality in majesty. For this is praised by angels and archangels, cherubim too, and seraphim who never cease to cry out each day, as with one voice they acclaim. gives you praise, for through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and the working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy, and you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun unto its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become for us the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me.
Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray upon the oblation of your church and recognising the sacrificial victim by whose death you willed to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you so that we may attain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and in charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis, our Pope, Christopher, our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people, the baptised, whom you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family, whom you have summoned before you. And in your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world, to our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life. Give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory. Through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, O glory and honour is yours forever. We now stand together with great confidence at the Saviour's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil and graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress. So we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Let us offer each other the sign of Christ's peace.
Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, my soul shall be healed. Since you are the children of God, God has sent into your hearts the spirit of his son, the spirit who cries out, Abba, Father.
Let us pray. May receiving this sacrament, O Lord our God, bring us health of body and soul as we confess your eternal Holy Trinity and undivided unity through Christ our Lord. Amen. Dear friends, great to be with you again this week. Um, of course, we go out with that great truth that God doesn't love from a distance. I think as St. Augustine said, where there is love, there is the Trinity. Um, it's an extraordinary a revelation of God, that God is not distant. And when you think about it, it sounds quite ridiculous then to say that where is God? <laughs> he uh, permeates absolutely everything we know, we love and we cherish. So let us go forward with that truth and proclaim that same truth of Father, Son and Holy Spirit uh, to the world. The Lord be with you. Thanks be to God.